Good afternoon, Earl of Arch, and welcome to our first ever Black History Month virtual assembly. During Black History Month, Canadians celebrate the many achievements and contributions of Black Canadians and their communities who, throughout history, have done so much to make Canada a culturally diverse, compassionate, and prosperous country. The 2022 theme for Black History Month is February and Forever, celebrating Black history today and every day, which focuses on recognizing the daily contributions that Black Canadians make to our country. Our assembly reminds me of a quote by Arthur Chan, and it reads, diversity is fact, equity is choice, inclusion is an action, belonging is the outcome. And it is this deep sense of belonging that we will continue to strive for here at Earl of March. Thank you for joining us. Hi, I'm Huda. And I'm Emni. And we welcome you to Earl's first Black History Month Assembly. Today, we hope to have laid the foundation for years to come and start a brand new tradition. But first, here's a little video of what Black History Month is all about. February. So, many teachers and schools are celebrating Black History Month but there are still many misconceptions and misunderstandings about the past, present, and future of this celebration. So today, I thought we'd go back to the beginning. Hi, this is Mike Hines, and I'm a professor here at the Stanford Graduate School of Education, where my work focuses on the history of America's schools. What we now know as Black History Month had its beginnings as Negro History Week, which was invented by the famed historian, educator, and activist Carter G. Woodson in 1926. Negro History Week was a direct challenge to traditional curricula of the time period, which often degraded and dehumanized Black people. Negro History Week was also inextricably linked to Black calls for social and political equality. More than just a chance to talk about a few notable achievements, Negro History Week was a call to action. Although Negro History Week became one of his most widely known interventions, it was only part of Dr. Woodson's efforts to develop, democratize, and disseminate information on Black history. He also pursued this work through the establishment of the Association for Negro Life and History, its journals, the Journal of Negro History, and the Negro History Bulletin, and textbooks, speeches, pamphlets, and materials for every grade level from college down to kindergarten. Now, Woodson didn't do this work alone. Moving from idea to reality took the dedication of thousands of black teachers, most of them women, who were largely responsible for shaping the celebration through their work in the classroom. It also took the work of entire communities, including churches, fraternities and sororities, libraries and lodges, social clubs, and civic organizations. This reflected Woodson's desire to encourage lay people, not just academics, to preserve and present their own histories. As the movement continued to grow, it outstripped the bounds of a single week. And the word Negro, which was outdated by the 1960s, was replaced by a new generation born and raised in the civil rights struggle. Black History Month emerged in its current form during those decades and is still going strong. So, is this celebration still relevant today? Well, it depends on who you ask. Critics charge that the progress we've made from the 1920s to the 2020s has largely made Black History Month irrelevant. Or that worse, singling out Black history is actually counterproductive to broader efforts at inclusion. Although we may have made progress, however, research from the Southern Poverty Law Center and other sources still shows that we are far from our goal of honoring the multiple voices in our classrooms and challenging dominant narratives. At the same time, new and emerging movements for racial justice call out for historical context, which our schools simply fail to provide. Carter G. Woodson himself was cautiously optimistic that students in the future would no longer need Black History Month if we taught in ways that honored and elevated our students and told their stories all year long. But we're not there yet. So Black History Month will continue to be what it always has been, a celebration, a stinging indictment, and a call to action, all in one.
Our first guest is Adrian Cadet, a teacher at Woodruff High School here at the OCDSB. Ms. Cadet is also a host on Ottawa U's radio station. She's a passionate activist, a natural educator, and simply pro-black. Greetings from where I sit here on Turtle Island in the territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. I bring you greetings in the spirit of the father of Negro History Week and our Auntie Jean, mother of Canadian Black History Month. My name is Adrian Cadet. I am an educator here in Ottawa. On most days, you can find me in room 216 at Woodruff High School. I am one of two Black department heads in the school district, so I am Black History. I have the wonderful weekly opportunity of also being one of the teachers of the Black Youth Forum course, something that we started five years ago and just granting credits for the journey three years ago. This is cohort five, and I'm proud to be able to stand along with my students from that class and you, students of Earl of March, as you celebrate and have celebrated Black History Month. I know that often the question about why do we have Black History Month can be a place where people do start. Well, I'm here to share with you that there has been there have been people of Black African descent in Canada since 1509. Um, even if we only look through the lens of enslavement, we know that the first Black person. Um, was brought to Canada to be sold to a friend of Samuel de Champlain. That was in 1628, and Canada had slavery until 1834 when the British passed the Emancipation Act. So right here in Canada, there is more than enough history from coast to coast. We can talk about Africville in Nova Scotia. We can talk about the 250th anniversary of Black Loyalists sailing back to Sierra Leone. We can talk about Screech from Newfoundland as a product of Jamaica traded for codfish that Jamaicans would use to make their national dish, aki and salt fish. Or we can talk about the Jamaican Maroons who were tricked by the British into a peace treaty after a 100 year conflict. And they were brought, deported from Jamaica and brought to Nova Scotia where they contributed to building the citadel, highways, and other fortresses. We can go on the other side of our country and we can talk about Hogan's Alley and the importance Hogan's Alley was to the life of the most amazing guitar player, Jimi Hendrix, whose grandmother lived in Vancouver. We can talk about John Ware and his cowboy skills, so amazing that when he was uh, when he arrived in Amber Valley, 160 African Americans running from racial terrorism in Oklahoma, he establishes a contest where you can demonstrate your real cowboy skills. That is the legacy of today's um, Calgary Stampede. We can talk about Montreal and the uh, story of Marie-Joseph Angelique, who is credited or said to have burned down much of what is today old Montreal. But her story at trial becomes the first narrative of an enslaved woman. We can talk about Viola Desmond. After all, she is on your $10 bill. And we can talk about her sister, Wanda Robson, who died just in this month of February. We can talk about Albert Jackson, Canada's first black male postal carrier. We can talk about a new person that I've discovered because we can always discover something new about Canadian history. I discovered this year the story of a man named Joe Fortes. 
Joe Fortes was originally from Trinidad and he worked on the ships, which is what landed him at the port in Vancouver, where he immediately became the unofficial lifeguard and therefore Vancouver's first black lifeguard. Uh, he taught numerous people to swim. He taught, he saved, is credited with saving more than 30 people's lives because at the time, swimming wasn't something that people did recreationally and some people, a lot of people, didn't even know how to swim. Joe Fortes was so important to the city of Vancouver that even after his death, on the anniversary of the city of Vancouver, the people of Vancouver were posed a question. Who is the most important living or dead person to ever live in Vancouver? Overwhelmingly, the people of Vancouver voted that to be Joe Fortes. 66 years after his death. Well, on February 9th, Joe Fortes would have been 100 years old. And in that year, using um, CBC, Being Black in Canada, has done a documentary about his life. I want to also share with you this amazing story that is also part of that documentary series. And this story is about the Jamaican patty. Well, the patty, the Jamaican patty, um, whether you have it in Jamaica or other parts of the Caribbean, is, is kind of street food and very popular amongst school children. Jamaicans have this amazing treat where you put it inside of what we call in Guyana a butter flap. You put it inside of another piece of bread and that is your lunch. It's inexpensive. It's sold on almost every corner and every shop. And it's so it's therefore very accessible. As people from the Caribbean located themselves in neighborhoods like the Eglinton and Oakwood neighborhood in Toronto, they established businesses. One of the most famous patty shops in the 80s was called the Kensington Patty Palace. Kensington Patty Palace, Jamaican immigrant, came, opened up a patty business, and started cranking them out until in February of 1986, he got a visit from a Canadian government official who let him know that he needed to change the name from patty, because in Canada, a patty is the thing that goes in between your bun and is called a hamburger. The fear is that the definition of patty apparently would make people confused. Am I eating a hamburger or am I eating this delicious Caribbean treat? So he was told that he had to change the name. They were like, why don't you call it a Jamaican beef pocket? How about you call it a Caribbean pocket? Beef turnover. They gave a whole series of names and no matter what they said, the community pushed back because they felt this was an attack on their culture. After all, Canada was trying to ban the patty. It was even in a newspaper. The prime minister of the day, Brian Mulroney, was about to visit Jamaica. So he was like, I don't want to have to deal with this when I go to their country. So we need to solve this. But at first, it wasn't looking good for the Jamaican patty. Well, when they had their meeting, they came to a compromise. And they added that word in front of the word patty. So the Jamaican patty lives. And that's why on February the 23rd, every year, it is patty day. So I know that when I'm recording this video for you, it is the 22nd. So you better believe that tomorrow or whenever you see this, I will have had my body weight in patties in celebration. Those are some of the stories that we don't always get a chance to learn about in school. We can have a long conversation later about why that exists, but for right now, we want to share, or I would like to share with you, that Black History Month can be about those stories and some of the amazing people who have made history. And 
It can also be the everyday people that are around us all the time, like Yvonne Harper, Ottawa's first black principal who gave me my job when I was right out of university and I came home and I was like, I have no job. And my mom called her. She's studying education. Do you have anything going on? And that's when I started my teaching career as an educator. We can talk right here about people like Glenroy Gilbert. Not only is he a multiple um, medal winner in track and field at the Olympic level, world championship level, Commonwealth Games level, Pan Am Games level. He is also a winter Olympian in bobsled. He did try that for a couple Olympics. And he's a graduate of our school system. He went to Laurentian High School, a high school that doesn't exist anymore. We can talk about um, a woman named Dr. May Frith. Dr. Frith allowed us to learn through her about the power of linguistics and the power of the spoken word when she would have her African and Caribbean languages class that allowed us to know and understand that the vernacular we spoke with in our informal times as students together was actually not a patois, that it was rooted in African languages and African spiritual traditions. There are so many Caribbean words that connect right back to our African roots like joke and ono and kunu and things like that that tell us that when you go to those places and you hear those words, you're like, hey, my grandmother used to talk like that sometimes in some ways. I want to tell you that black history is not just in the month of February, but if we go with the spirit of Carter G. Woodson's vision of Negro History Week, where he identified two important heroes whose birthdays were on the opposite end of the week in the middle of February, Abraham Lincoln on one end, President's Day, and on the other end, Frederick Douglass. That created his moment to then say, what we need to do is in the month or in this week, highlight the excellence and achievement, but celebrate all year round. So grateful for Jean Augustine standing up in the house my senior year of high school and saying, here in Canada, we declare moving forward that this too would be February, a celebration of black history. And we want to emphasize that that celebration is Canadian history in intent and understanding. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to share a few words with you today, a little bit of history and some encouragement to continue searching, continue to explore and continue the possibility that you too our black history. Thank you for having me. Thank you to the students who invited me and thank you to your efforts for the celebration in this month long of black excellence. Have yourselves a safe and wonderful continued assembly. Thank you, Earl of March. Beautifully said, Ms. Cadet. Thank you for sharing your experiences and giving us the inspiration to share our voices. We recognize the importance of remembering that Black History Month needs to be celebrated all year long. Our next guest will be Director Williams Taylor of the OCDSB. Before becoming the Director of Education of our school board, she has had many diverse teaching experiences. Hello, I'm so honored to have been invited to provide a keynote presentation to all of you in recognition of Black History Month. During the month of February, we turn our minds to recognizing excellence in the Black community, in the past, in recent history, and in our present time. We learn about global leaders and the impact of local change makers, visionaries, and heroes. The stories of the roads that have been traveled demonstrate the diversity within the Black community. To be Black in Ottawa, in Canada, and in the world at any given time in history is not one thing. 
context, geography, ancestry, language, faith, sexual, or gender identity all inform the realities experienced by people of African descent. Interestingly, while the stories and the journeys vary widely, there are some themes that are featured in the experiences of many people of African descent, despite the time, the place, or context in which their stories unfold. Barriers like loneliness, invisibility, navigating stereotypes, and a lack of access represent some of these themes. Some of the themes, like incredible talent, courage, persistence, confidence, and pride are also keenly featured in the journeys and characters of Black people in our communities. One of the questions that you asked me was to talk a little bit about my journey to where I am today. I was born in Jamaica, and I came to Canada when I was 13 years old. While Jamaica had, and still has, many remnants of a colonial history, Jamaica was a British colony, Jamaicans are very proud of our history and our identities. Anyone who has ever seen Usain Bolt in action would see that very distinct Jamaican pride. So as kids, myself and my sister, we learned about national heroes. Their images were painted on murals and their stories were told to us so that we understood how our country was developed and who we were as a people. One of those national heroes was Nanny of the Maroons. Nanny was born in Ghana, but it is unclear how she came to arrive in Jamaica. What is known is that she became a leader of a ferocious network of Africans in Jamaica who had escaped enslavement and who fought skillfully and successfully to defend the freedom of their maroon community and to bring others to freedom. As a young girl at school, I not only heard these stories, but I also saw that same pride, strength, and determination all around me as I had black teachers, Black doctors and dentists, community leaders were black, artists and performers, politicians. In other words, black excellence was not historical nor a story to search for. Black excellence was assumed. Excellence and achievement were the default. Anything else was the exception. I share this to say that with a default setting that assumes success, there's a confidence and personal intrinsic motivation that becomes the foundation of everything. And I can say that my sister and I felt that as we came as children to Canada. As an adolescent in a community of very few black people in Winnipeg, Manitoba, maintaining that confidence was sometimes hard. It wasn't until university that I reconnected with the voices and images of black excellence through books, film, and theater, and through the networks that I could connect with. Another challenge, which was a barrier faced by many people of African descent in North America and Europe, is being the only one, being alone. Whether it's in a classroom, a social group, a professional network, being the only one is a reality. There's a stress here in that shared experiences, shared perspectives help to foster a sense of belonging and connection. And when it's missing, it is felt. I became a teacher in 1989, 33 years ago. And when people ask me what I do now, I still say I'm a teacher. And then I have to say that my own experiences as a young black woman shaped so much of what I brought into my classroom. It caused me to question the way the curriculum was taught and who it was for. So I changed it. I was tuned into the students that I had in my classrooms, those kids whose stories were not being told, and I tried to make sure that there was space for those stories. And then I started to learn about the writers and the thinkers and social leaders who were studying and talking about equity in education in a formal way. I learned about James Banks, Dr. Lisa Delpit, and Gloria Ladson Billings. I read The Dream Keepers, a book about how teachers who were committed to the success of African-American students taught in a very special way to ensure their success. I was fortunate to be invited to work under one of the most significant education leaders in Ontario, Dr. Avis Glaze, at the Ministry of Education, and then after that at York University Faculty of Education with Dr. Patrick Solomon and Dr. Carlos James. Alongside these leaders in education, Black leaders in education, 
I learned, I explored, and developed an informed equity lens. My work brought me to leadership in Toronto, Durham region, and now here in Ottawa. In all this work, I traveled to Los Angeles, Cincinnati, Detroit, Israel, China, Korea, and so many places in Canada as well. Some of the travels were for learning. Some were for teaching others. In all this work, there was always the challenge of not belonging, of someone who did not believe I should be there that I was too opinionated, too focused on equity, or just too different. But you know what? There was also people who challenged me, championed my spirit, encouraged me, pushed me hard to believe in my potential. Some of those folks looked like me and some did not. What did I do? I listened, I learned, I read, I talked with others, I wrote my ideas down. Sometimes I was quiet and I watched. I remained clear about what I believed in, and I absolutely knew that I could not, would not make my way alone. I embraced my networks, the advice, the push, the criticism, and the care. Sometimes I was wrong, and sometimes I had my own mistakes to clean up and start over again. Sometimes I was scared to try, but there was never much time for the self-indulgence of fear. So now here we are in 2022, and as we look around us at the things that are happening in Ottawa and globally, we know that oppression based on privilege and hate are still present in our society today. The persistence of this reality does not in any way obscure your greatness, your excellence, and potential in all of your many identities. Each of you brings an identity that informs your lived experience. Those lived experiences give you a unique perspective that is your entry point into the fabric of our community. Not everyone will understand your lived experiences and the stories and the journeys that make you who you are. How you share the journey, how you write the story will come to you. Sometimes it will be shared in the heat of anger sometimes through your quiet observation, through the questions you ask or through the example that you set. Sometimes you will choose how your story will come into the space and sometimes it will happen on its own. But what I've learned is that our identities are precious and they are formed and shaped in many ways. And when we nourish, nurture and celebrate the identities of those around us, we nurture, nourish, and celebrate our own. So as we celebrate Black History Month and draw on the stories of Nanny of the Maroons, Marcus Garvey, Afua Cooper, Oscar Peterson, James Baldwin, and so many others, let's connect the themes of their stories of resilience, resistance, confidence, and talent to unleash our own potential as we realize our personal excellence. We are honored to have had Director William Taylor share such personal words with Earl. We are so happy to see a black woman in such powerful position doing impactful change every single day. In our community, however, it is important to recognize the smaller victories. And now for our final guest, Amateur Rahim. Amateur Rahim is an extremely involved student at South Carson High School and in the OCDSB. She has paved the way for students behind her, always inspiring with her natural drive and leadership. Hello everyone, thank you for that wonderful introduction. As you heard, my name is Emma Turahim Salam Alada, and I'm a grade 12 student at South Carleton High School. I'm also a student trustee with the Ottawa Carleton District School Board. I think um, as students, we a lot of us don't think that like our ideas have any impact on the system that we are receiving our education in. Especially as marginalized students, it kind of feels like you're going along with the wave and then as soon as you're done with high school, you just deal with the same wave in university. So I was thinking of ways that we can try and fix this, at least for high school students, which is how I came up with the Alternative Guidance Counseling Initiative. Um, 
the this initiative would be a way for students to access guidance counselors who um, have both gone under undergone cultural sensitivity training um, or ha or and or identify as part of um, different kind of different cultural and ethnic groups. For example, we'd have a black guidance counselor or an indigenous guidance counselor and intersectionality would be taken into account for all these different guidance counselors. For example, there can be a black and there could be a black LGBTQ plus identifying guidance counselor, uh, LGBTQ plus Muslim guidance counselor, and so on and so forth. Um, the idea, however, I think one thing that's really important to point out is that as, as students, I feel like we all, as BIPOC students, I feel like a lot of us know that we don't receive as much, we don't see as much representation of ourselves, both in day-to-day -day life, in media, in all these different forms. It's hard to find representation in, um, for a BIPOC person, whether you're an Indian student looking to see representation for people of your own culture as teachers or as guidance counseling staff, as principals, and so on and so forth. So I think one of the ways that we're bridging that this this initiative plans to bridge that gap is with cultural humility and sensitivity training. It's one thing to, representation will always be important. However, having the cultural humility and cultural awareness about a variety of different people will help people feel heard. If you're understanding the other person's culture, if you're trying to be understanding of the other person's situation, it can get rid of a lot of the different kinds of um, forms of hatred that we see today, whether that's racism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, homophobia and all these different things by having that kind of empathy within ourselves it gets rid of these different forms of hatred and i think by having staff being trained as well to um Im to kind of embody that with students will help the success of this program and as somebody who in grade nine when i started high school i actually didn't like talking i didn't like doing anything like this i hated doing presentations and i didn't like talking to any kind of teacher um with for anything and i think that um being after like going through like these different things and trying to put forward different projects i think the mo one of the biggest messages about this that i want to tell everybody here today is that it doesn't really like matter what your idea is but getting out that idea is what's the most important one of the th like um you might think that it's not that great of an idea or that somebody else should might have done this already or that nobody would pay attention to it but by voicing it first you let other people like hear and give you feedback before just giving yourself the negative negative feedback um <clears throat> negative feedback i hope that that like gives um, a little bit of hope to anybody who's kind of thinking within themselves about different things that they want to do but they don't think it's good enough just try to put yourself out there and put especially i encourage um bipoc students within this school to put yourself out there although it's a little bit it can be a little bit difficult to do so putting yourself out there is what gets things started gets the ball rolling gets people involved and gets these initiatives like this getting um get started one of the surprising things that I heard when I started this was that actually a t uh, one of the staff was like, I can't believe that we hadn't thought of this before. And I was kind of shocked because I was like, I didn't think I would be one of those people who I'd always thought about back in grade nine, grade eight, that somebody else, I wouldn't be that somebody else. But I hope that I can inspire other students to kind of um, do their best to start their own clubs and initiatives within this school and across our school board. Thank you so much for listening to my little speech presentation on that, and I hope that you guys have a great day and assembly. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Amateur Rahim. From a student at South Carleton to students at Earl, we hope you have been inspired by this assembly. Let's hear a few words from our very own. By taking a look at different aspects of Canada's history and different perspectives of how that history was shaped, we should wonder about what has been left out of Canada's Black history and how we do a better job of getting perspectives of Black people into its story. Thank you, Earl. 
A quote I like is, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter, encouraging us to advocate for ourselves that all the progress we've achieved and all that will be achieved has been done because many of our peers stood up and shared their voices. I would say the average Canadian student doesn't know much about Black history in Canada. At our knowledge, we all know about the Underground Railroad, but there's a long history that remains unknown. Wider educational systems need to bridge the importance of Black history on Canadian Black history. Ways we've been doing this so this past month, using texts by Black authors and teaching students about the important Black figures, especially local ones. Now we strive to learn more about the struggles and of enslaved ancestors. North America's first race riot, Gabriel Prosser, anti-discriminatory acts, and many more. And even though I don't know much about these histories either, I'm taking the initiative to do so this month and onwards, having a more global perspective in our community. This month is a time where we celebrate who we are and honor our roots, in which we highlight Black excellence in all areas of our life and celebrate the contributions made by ancestors. Black History Month to me is a time to see what the people before us fought for, making sure all of their efforts are going noticed, a very limited but necessary acknowledgement of the rich history of Black people. Okay. We don't want to be a school. People don't want to speak up because they're afraid they won't be heard. That change isn't going to happen. Everything is going to stay the same. It's time for us to put our barriers down and for all students to finally collaborate together. Not just for today, tomorrow, but forever. Build each other up instead of turning each other down. At Earl, we want to create a Black Association, Allies Club, Together Communities, where everyone wants to see each other succeed. I'm Nigerian and just learning about the struggles and history of my home country. The perseverance, the grit they have, is a motivator to push me to be great. Empowers me to share my knowledge with young Africans as well. Being part of a school community as great as Earl has allowed students and I to reach our full potentials. Whether that has been creating a club, part of a sports team, or making an assembly, really have the resources and tools needed to cause a change, which we're doing now. Yes. So Black History Month is important to me because it gives us a chance to uh, remind us how important Black people are and how much they contribute to our uh, to our society, um, and it helps remember like my ancestors and everything that um, our community has done, and it really brings us together um, as a people and incorporates a bunch of different cultures from all around the world. So that's why Black History means uh, a lot to me.